aren't you thankful he is not done with me yet? He's not done with you yet. Wow. I've, so, I've got so much to share with you this morning, and I'm so excited. We're launching a brand new message series. And uh, we should probably just pray. Jesus. One of our team members in our prayer time earlier gave this prophetic word inviting us to disarm ourselves in the presence of the Lord. It's a word for all of us. Because the reality is sometimes we come into his presence and it's, it's hard for us to be vulnerable, especially when the plow is going to dig deep. So Jesus today we're making the choice, the purposeful choice to disarm ourselves. We're dropping our guard when it comes to you. Of course, we need to be guarded against the enemy, but when we come into your presence, God, we just drop our guard. Speak to us today, Jesus. Most importantly, Jesus, will you move and 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 bring revelation in a way only you can by your great power. Amen. Amen. The Lord has been speaking to me the last several weeks and, and uh, it, it's been kind of a cool thing. Uh, this message series is, is really birthed out of just fresh revelation that the Lord has been giving to me. Um, and, and I'm going to try to connect the dots a little bit today. Um, I'm introducing our new message series this morning, but one of the things that came my way that the Lord spoke to me powerfully through was uh, a recent message compilation from Bill Johnson, and there was just a three-minute snippet in particular that really grabbed me, and I just want to start this morning with this, so take a look at the screen. This morning. I know that this is uh, something that we repeat on somewhat of a regular basis, but I do it again today knowing that it's important for us to kind of pick up the slack in any area uh, that the Lord would enable us to pick up the slack in. And, and this is one in particular. God has called us to walk in equal measure of power and character. Both are important. Both are equally important. Now, I am, as much as anybody in the room, am frustrated with people who live a very compromised lifestyle and then pray for the sick and expect miracles to happen. It, it, it annoys me to pieces. And I understand why a large part of the church has come to the conclusion that character is more important than power. I understand how. I understand why. But it's a reaction to an error that in itself creates another error. I ask people the question, all right, what's more important then, to not quench the Holy Spirit or to not grieve the Holy Spirit? See, they both have equal measure of value, of importance. We grieve the Holy Spirit with sin, wrong ambition, wrong selfish attitudes. We grieve him through wrong activity. We quench him by the failure to cooperate with divine activity. We stop the flow of, it's to quench. To grieve the Holy Spirit is focused on character. To quench the Holy Spirit is focused on power. Those are the two legs we stand on. I want legs of equal length. It, it doesn't make me a noble person to emphasize character and not emphasize power. You'll get applause from the religious crowd, but it doesn't produce anything to bring about transformation in culture itself. There is so much in there. We'll probably need to watch this in coming weeks again. Two legs we stand on, character and power. This really summarizes where we're going in this message series that we're calling Empowered. Um, character and power. Listen, I, I want you to know I love the Holy Spirit. And, and I have since I was a child. I love the fire of the Holy Spirit. But the reality for me, and maybe this is true for you too, is that sometimes the manifestations of the Holy Spirit make me squirm. 
Am I the only one? And, and this, is, this is probably why what Bill Johnson is talking about, whole, whole sections of the church have said, I don't really want to have anything to do with the power. We'll just concentrate on character. Because the power makes us squirm. But I really believe, and and this is where I feel like Jesus is calling us as a church to, I believe that Jesus is calling us to an understanding that both are important and, 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 and both legs have to be of equal length. Character and power. Kind of interesting because when I began working on this message series, it was going to be a message series that focused on character, and we're going to go there. And then Jesus kept bringing me back to stuff about power. Do you know that you can recognize when Jesus is speaking to you when the same things just keep coming up again and again and again? Okay, Bible passages about power. Uh, podcasts, videos about power. Uh, a few weeks ago, a bunch of us from Connect went to the movie in the theater called The God Man. It was about power evangelism. People that were going out into, into public and they were bringing prophetic words and, and miracles into the public square and, and leading people to an encounter with Jesus through his power, okay? That's what that movie was about. That movie made me squirm. Anybody else in the room that was with there? It, it, it made me squirm. And, and then the very next day after watching that movie, I was... I was in my office and I was working on this message series and this song came on my stereo. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? Whew. It it, it was like, I mean, Jesus is very kind and gentle, but it was like he slapped me across the face. Because I'm thinking to myself, I, I, I watched this movie, and then, then Nikki wanted us to watch another one of these Darren Wilson movies, and they're all about the manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit in public places. And I'm like, I'm not comfortable, and I'm wrestling with God because he keeps bringing this idea to my... And I'm, I'm squirming. Who am I to deny what the Lord can do? playing over and over and over and over on my stereo. Was it the Holy Spirit speaking to me? Was it Jesus bringing correct? Was Jesus saying, I have a new thing for you, Russ Michael. I have a new thing for you, Connect. I'm convinced, today I stand before you convinced that Jesus is calling Connect to live and move in a fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is doing for us. A fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And as a way of introducing this message series, and and we're going to talk about character, we're going to talk about people fishing, and and power is going to be the the common link between these two topics. And as a way of of introducing this series today, I want to take you to three passages from the Gospels. We're going to look at a passage from Luke, a passage from Mark, and a passage from John, and we're going to see what empowerment looks like today. Are are you down? Are you ready for this? Okay. Okay. and, and as, I was, as I was praying through my message this morning um, and, and thinking and meditating on empowerment, this is kind of what came into my spirit. If Jesus said it, I believe it. How about you? And if Jesus lived it, I need it. I'm talking about empowerment, okay? Just say that with me. If Jesus said it, I believe it. And if Jesus lived it, I need it. That was just fresh this morning. Think that was Holy Spirit? Okay, it was. Guarantee you. Let me take you to the first passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 6. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there with me. Luke chapter 6, I'm going to be in the TPT today. 
And here's what we're going to see. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Jesus revealed what power looks like. Jesus revealed what power looks like. In Luke chapter 6, uh, what, what we're reading about here is a very early uh, account in Jesus' ministry. Um, just prior to, to this description we're going to read, Jesus had gone up on a mountain and he had spent all night in prayer. Okay, Have you ever tried to spend all night in prayer? Years ago, we used to have all-night prayer meetings, and, and just about everybody would always fall asleep in a pew somewhere. It, it, it's tough. But this is what Jesus did. He, went, he spent all night in prayer, and then he invited the disciples up on the mountain, and he chose the 12. Okay? So this is the context of what we're going to read uh, in Luke chapter 6. Are you there with me? Verse 17. Jesus and his apostles came down now from the hillside, to a level field where a large number of disciples waited along with a massive crowd, people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and the coastal district of Tyre and Sidon. Now, what's important here about this description that Luke gives us of this people group, it's not just Jews here where Jesus is beginning to minister. He's going to start teaching in a couple of minutes. Um, but but what, what this people group is, is a whole bunch of Jewish people and Gentile people. So it's a big mixture of people. Let's keep reading. Verse 18. They had all come to listen to the word so they could be healed of their diseases and set free from tormenting demonic powers. This to me is so significant. They had all come to listen to the word. John's gospel tells us that the word is Jesus. We tend to think of the word of God being the Bible. Actually, the Bible is pretty consistent in identifying that Jesus himself is the embodiment of the word of God. And listen, when we encounter Jesus, when we hear Jesus, we are healed. This is why we come to Jesus. This is why, this is why non-believers come to Jesus. They need healing. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. The entire crowd eagerly tried to come near Jesus to touch him to receive healing because a tangible supernatural power emanated from him and healed all that came close to him. I love this description, and it challenges me. A tangible, supernatural power emanated from Jesus. Jesus revealed what power looks like. Now listen, I want to propose to you that almost all of us came to Jesus because we needed healing. I don't know that I know very many people at all who just went on a theological quest or an intellectual journey to prove that Christianity is the one true religion. I, and, and I'm sure there are people, and in fact, I know some famous people, that they, they set out to prove that Christianity was fake and then they found out that it was true and they received Jesus. But most of us come to Jesus because we need some sort of healing. This is true of this crowd that assembled to hear Jesus communicate the word. And of course, in, in, the, in the Gospels, we read a lot about people who had physical sicknesses, right? And they would come to Jesus, or it talks about uh, demonic oppression or demonic control over people's lives. But there's also something that sometimes we overlook. We come to Jesus because we have soul sickness. We come to Jesus because we need healing of our soul. What am I talking about? Shame. Regret. Guilt. We could even go so far as to say depression is a form of soul sickness. Not always. Sometimes it's a chemical thing. But we come to Jesus because our souls need to be healed. 
And listen, if you and I are empowered by Jesus, people will get healed when they encounter Jesus in us. I got a phone call this week from a young man that Chris and I have known for many years, and uh, and we hadn't talked with him for probably six or seven years, and uh, we suspected that he had had more or less wandered away from the Lord. We didn't know, but we suspected that things weren't right in his life, and um, and a few months ago. Uh, the Lord just brought him into my mind and I couldn't get him out of my mind. I prayed for him a little bit and then finally I decided I'm going to send him a text and find out what's going on with him. And he called me a a short time later and we talked on the phone for about 30 minutes or so uh, a couple months ago and and he was just guarded. Like like what I was talking about, uh, the word for us today is to disarm ourselves. Um, On that day when I was talking to him, he was armed. He, He had his walls up and And he controlled the conversation, he controlled what we talked about, and then when he was done at about 27 minutes, he was done and said goodbye and hung up. Well, this week he called me again and we talked for two hours. And this time he was disarmed. And in the process of this conversation, he said to me, Russ, there's a reason why I haven't talked to you and Chris for six years. He said, because I I, I was so ashamed of who I've become. And he talked about the regrets that he has because of choices he made. It's soul sickness. And why did he choose to call me this week and and talk to me for two hours about shame and regret? It's because he needs to be healed. And I'm not going to heal him, but I think the reason he's reaching out to me is because I... I think he hopes that the Jesus in me will heal him. And if I'm walking in the empowerment that Jesus gives to us, then this guy's going to get healed. And there's going to be all kinds of restoration that's going to happen, right? This is what I'm talking about. Jesus revealed to us what power looks like. Now, next week, we're going to continue in Luke chapter 6. And so if you want to, if you want to move ahead and, and uh, be teacher's pet and, and read more than you're required to, uh, you could keep reading in Luke 6 this week. Don't do it right now because we're going to now go to the Gospel of Mark. Okay? Here's the second thing I want to share with you today from Mark's Gospel is this. Jesus commissioned us to go in power. Okay, Jesus revealed to us what power looks like, and Jesus also commissioned us to go in power. Now, I want to take you to Mark chapter 16, and this is Mark's version of the Great Commission. Did you know that every gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, has a version of the Great Commission where we're told to go into the world and make disciples, okay? There's there's a version of it in every gospel. The one that preachers usually use is the one from Matthew. It's probably the one that you're most familiar with if you're a church person. But there's a reason why we hardly ever use Mark's Great Commission, and it's because it makes us squirm, okay? So this is the one I'm going to use today, and we're going to squirm together, all right? Here we go. Mark 16, starting at verse 15. Jesus said to the disciples, as you go into all the world, preach openly the wonderful news of the gospel to the entire human race. And whoever believes the good news and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe the good news will be condemned. And these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. And they will lay hands on the sick and heal us. Okay? Pretty cool, right? Does it make you squirm? It makes us squirm, maybe, 
Because as believers, we take stock of our lives and realize this is a really high bar that Jesus just set for us, right? It's a high bar. But I believe that Jesus is calling Connect to live and move in a fresh empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And I believe Jesus is raising the bar for Connect. He's raising the bar for me. Will you come with me? We have followed Jesus as we raise the bar, as he raises the bar. Let's, let's, let's talk about this description here from Mark. According to Jesus, what does, what does empowered people fishing look like? I mean, re- really, this is the Great Commission. The Great Commission says you're going you're gonna to go out and you're going to go people fishing, right? It, it looks like this. It looks like preaching the gospel. It looks like driving out demons. It looks like speaking in tongues. If you don't like that, it's in the book. (laughs) And the next one is the one people probably squirm over the most, this supernatural protection from snakes and poison, right? Now, I I just want to tell you, we're not bringing out the boxes of snakes today, okay? Maybe next week. No, just kidding, just kidding. That's not us. And, and, and I, really, I really studied, I studied through this really carefully here. This, this is not talking about coming to church together and, and, and tempting the snakes to bite you. This is a metaphor for Holy Spirit protection. Supernatural protection is what this is talking about. And it's actually a reference to uh, Psalm 91 that says this. You will walk on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the young lion and the serpent. And for all the wacko churches that keep boxes of snakes under the, under the pulpit, okay, nobody keeps boxes of lions and try to trample. The, okay, this is a metaphor. So don't get worried. But it's talking about supernatural protection. And the last one that Jesus says will follow us is healing the sick. Preach the gospel, drive out demons, speak in tongues, be supernaturally protected from all kinds of attacks, spiritual and human, and healing the sick. It's a high bar. But here's what I know. When we press into these things, Jesus empowers us, and we can see these things manifest in our lives if we press in. I remember uh, the first mission trip, maybe it was a second mission trip, uh, that Chris and I led for a group of young adults. This is 20 plus years ago. And we were uh, going to work with Chris's mom and dad, who at the time were missionaries in Mexico. And of course, Art and Brenda Kunas are, are missionaries in the same area. And we took this team of young adults to Mexico. And, and Judy had told us, Chris's mom, Judy, had told us, listen, part of our ministry is going to be going to pray for people who are oppressed, uh, controlled by demons. And so in preparation for this trip, uh, we, we did quite a lot of study from the scriptures, and, and we used a book called Power Healing by John Wimber. I don't know if any of you have read the book. It's, it's old now, but a wonderful book that trains you in, in how to minister powerfully. And in particular, I wanted to make sure that our team was ready to encounter demons. What I didn't know was that the first encounter we would have was actually with a young woman who was on our team. And we got to Mexico, and the night before we were going to begin our ministry, we were, uh, we were praying together, and we were standing in a circle, and we were holding hands, and this young woman was standing right next to me holding my hands, and what we were doing is we would turn to the person on our right, and we would lay our hands on this person to pray for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit for our ministry the next day. And when I turned to lay my hands on this young woman, she began to manifest a demonic presence. And I, I recognized it immediately. But it was the first time in my life that I had ever encountered a physical manifestation of a demon. Was I scared? No. I was surprised. 
Because I didn't expect it to be her. I thought it was going to be the next day when I was scared. (laughs) I was surprised, but listen, I had prepared myself. I was spiritually prepared. I had studied. I had learned. I, I knew what to do. And I laid my hands on this young woman, and I drove the demon out of her. And it didn't take a long time. It wasn't difficult. She was ready for deliverance. She wanted deliverance. And so there was, there was some drama that happened, and we all gathered around and, and prayed. And, and, and that, was, that was my first experience with driving out a demon. Now, in the years since, I have become increasingly aware that there are, do I dare say it? There are Americans that struggle with demons. There are people in our own community that struggle with demons. And from time to time, if we're full of the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, if we're following the commission of Jesus, there are going to be times when we have to drive out demons. There are times when we're ministering Jesus that we will need to minister healing, soul healing or maybe physical healing. There are times when we're going to need to prophesy what Jesus is saying to someone and um, and and and. And, and lead them to Jesus. Um, I was hoping Tino Riojas would be here today. I, I don't see them. They're online. Um, Chris, uh, Tino shared a story with you about an interaction he had in public this week. Do you think Tino would be okay if you shared that? Do you want me to share it? Chris hates public speaking more than anything in the world. I don't know if I know the details. Correct me if I'm wrong. Just shout it from the back. <laughs> Tino, Tino was out in a public place this week, and while he was interacting with some people, um, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit highlighted a young man to him, somebody he did not know. And the Lord said to him, Tino, go tell this young man that his mother is praying for him and he needs to go to church. And so Tino, Tino walked right up to a stranger and said, Your mother is praying for you, and you need to go to church. And the man was visibly shaken, and he said, how do you know this? And Tino said, because God told me. And then if I know the story right, Tino just turned and walked away. (laughs) Tino understands that he is commissioned by Jesus to go people fishing, and that a good, good part of people fishing is, is operating in power. It's the power that enables us to people fish effectively. Okay, remember number one, Jesus revealed what power looks like. Number two, Jesus commissioned us to go in power. You ready for number three? Here's where the squirming gets really intense. Number three, Jesus empowers us to do more. Jesus empowers us to do more. Listen to this verse from John 14. It's up on the screen. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do and even greater miracles than these. Jesus, really? Seriously. Here again, Jesus is just raising the bar. The person who who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do and even greater miracles than these because I'm going to be with my Father. In other words, he's going to be with the Father and we are Jesus' representatives on the earth. So we have to do the works that he called us to do. He empowers us to do more. Now, maybe I should have uh, defined the word empowered earlier, but I'm going to do it right here because I want you to understand what it means to be empowered, okay? 
there's two definitions I'm going to share with you. The first one is this. We've been given the right to do Jesus' work in the world. That's what it means to be empowered. You are given the right to do Jesus' work in the world. Or another R word you could use would be responsibility. We've been given the right and the responsibility to do Jesus' work in the world. This is what it means to be commissioned, is he gave you the responsibility to go and do more. Here's the second definition. We've been given the resources to do Jesus' work in the world. And this one probably answers the question of why do I squirm so much, probably more than the first definition. Jesus has given you and me the resources that we need to preach the gospel, drive out demons, heal the sick, speak in tongues, and all the rest of it. He's given us the re- What am I talking about resources? Anybody know? Who's the resource? I've told you that the answer is always Jesus, but in this case, it's Holy Spirit. Okay. The resource you and I need to be empowered so that we can do all the things Jesus has called us to do is Holy Spirit. Mic drop right there. You've been given the resource. At camp this last week, Kelly did a masterful job of explaining to us the difference between filled with the Holy Spirit and being baptized in the Spirit. When you're saved, when you say yes to Jesus, when you're born again, whatever word you want to use, when you come to Jesus, he gives you the Holy Spirit. No questions asked. You don't have to beg. He just fills you with the Holy Spirit. Okay? But then at some point in your Christian experience, he wants you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, which means you're going to get all wet, okay? And, and it's the difference of having Holy Spirit inside and having Holy Spirit all over you. And, and, and when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, you're going to be baptized with power. So when you're full of the Holy Spirit, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are empowered, you are given the resources to do Jesus' work in the world. And he empowers you to do more. So the question that I want to ask today is why don't we see more? Have you ever asked this question? People ask me that question quite often. Why don't we see more deliverance? Why don't we see more healing? Why don't we see more uh, conversions? And, a lot, and, and we can pin it on all kinds of things. The American church is, is, is lukewarm. The American church is going to go to hell. I mean, we can be really flippant. But I think there's deeper reasons why we don't see more. Maybe you've prayed for somebody. Maybe you've prayed for somebody to be healed and they weren't healed. What does that do to us when when we don't see what we're looking for? It makes us discouraged can make us disillusioned, and then we stop trying. Am I right? Or sometimes our expectations don't match what God is actually doing. And so we get discouraged. We we, we expect that God is going to do something, and and it doesn't happen the way we think it's going to happen, and we fail to see that God is actually at work doing something powerful. Okay, I, I, I I had a realization this week that has kind of Uh, built my faith. Those of you that were at family camp with us two years ago remember that Kim Bennett had a word for the Lord for me that God was healing my knee. I uh, I had an injury when I was very young on my right knee and I've had arthritis in this knee for many, many years. And two years ago, Kim said to me that, um, that God is healing my knee. She she laid hands on my knee and, and she prayed for me and, and I could feel something shift in that knee uh, at, at camp. And so 
I, I made the decision then at that time that I was going to, I called it walking out my healing. So uh, we went up to Glacier Park, and Chris and Nikki and I did some hikes, and, and I was so excited because I could feel that my knee was, was being healed. Now, over two years' time, I've gotten a little frustrated because my right knee doesn't match my left knee. Do you know what I'm talking about? So when, when, I, when I do a, a lunge with my left knee, it moves real slow, real, or, or I mean moves real smooth, real smooth, okay? And, and it works the way it's supposed to. When I do a lunge with my right knee, the one that Jesus healed, and he did, but when I, when I do a lunge with this knee, what I feel is that it, it kind of catches and then releases and catches and releases. And so when I, when I go into a lunge, it freaks me a little bit. So I'm not sure it's going to hold me. But this week, I, w- I was thinking about this with this idea of sometimes our expectation doesn't match what God is really doing. I realized what God did, he healed that knee of pain completely. But he didn't change the way the knee works. Does that make sense? Now, did God heal me? 100% yes. But because it doesn't match the right one, I can listen to the voice of doubt in my mind and say, maybe God didn't really heal me. Okay? So when doubt creeps in like that, it causes us to say, I I, I don't know that God can use me. I don't know that God really, does this make sense? I'm blah, blah, blahing. Okay, here's another reason we don't see more. Juan Carlos shared this with me. Where are you, Juan? All right, the light is blinding me behind your head. Juan Carlos shared this with me. Juan Carlos said, here in America, we've lost our passion for reaching lost people. And so we're not walking in this power because what, what Juan said was, you know, in the first century, people expected Jesus to come back tomorrow. There was this urgency to reach people for Jesus, and we've lost our urgency. Bill Johnson mentioned in that clip that I showed you that, that compromised lives will decrease our, infe- our effectiveness. Somebody else mentioned to me on our teaching team that, that they think that a lot of us want to live safe lives. Asking Jesus to heal somebody, asking Jesus to cast out demons, that seems really risky. Oh, character is so much more comfortable. Here's probably the best one. Why don't we see more? Because we don't know how to do it. So one of our goals in this message series is to teach you how to do it. Another one of our wonderful moments from camp this last week. It's Friday night, wasn't it? Kelly was teaching Sorry? It was Saturday. Thank you. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> Kelly was teaching. That's what's important. Saturday. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I'm, I'm talking to myself. It, I don't care what day it was. You care, as you should. Yeah. <laughs> Kelly was teaching one night at camp. And you guys would have so much fun watching us in our teaching team. It's, it's, it's quite a show. Um, anyway, our, our theme for camp was, was becoming fishers of men. And, and Kelly was sharing with us what it looks like to go people fishing full of power. And, and one of the things she asked us to do, we had, we had a young couple at camp who is brand new to Connect, and she asked them to come up. I'm, this was, I was squirming. Let me tell you, this was a squirmy moment. She asked this brand new couple to connect to come up to the front, and she invited about 20 people to come, gather around them, and begin to prophesy over them. These are people that are complete strangers to us at Connect, except we knew their names, okay? 
and she invited about 20 people to come and begin to prophesy, speak, speak words of, of strengthening, encouraging, and comforting. That's what 1 Corinthians 14 says over this young couple. And, and what do you think, Kelly? There were maybe a dozen people that shared prophetic words, probably. Everybody that went up there shared something. And it was amazing because as we were watching, there were one or two of those prophetic words that just rocked them. One for the guy, one for the girl. Married couple. Just rocked them. And then Kelly just beautifully took this moment to interview them and say, okay, some of these landed with you. We could see that these landed. And so we talked about that a little bit. And then, and then as she was wrapping up, Kelly said, now here's the deal. When it comes to prophecy, you have to practice. You have to practice, practice, practice. Because sometimes these prophetic words will land, and sometimes they'll be, eh, that, wasn't, that wasn't 100%. But listen, because we're not Old Testament believers, we don't stone false prophets. We have that in our brains. I don't want to be wrong, right? I don't want to be wrong. But the beautiful part of being a New Testament Christian is we all get Holy Spirit, and we all get empowered by Holy Spirit, and all we got to do is step out and try, and there's grace if it doesn't land perfectly, okay? Now, the same is true. Listen, the same is true of driving out demons and healing the sick and all the rest of it. All of this empowerment, the, the reason we don't see more, listen, is because we're not practicing enough. We have to practice. And sometimes, Jason and Kim, this frustrates you too, right? Because sometimes you, you, you receive a word that you believe God's going to heal somebody and then it doesn't happen. And then every once in a while you get a healed knee that two years later I'm still pain free. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. That, and that builds up your faith and makes you go, I'm going to keep practicing, right? So if we want to see more, we have to practice. Does it make sense? So... I don't know. I think in the next six weeks, we're going to practice a whole bunch. And let's see what happens when we press in to being empowered. Next week, I'm going to start on the first leg of character. And we're going we're to be in Luke chapter 6, and we're going to be talking about what empowered character looks like. And then after that, when we get to August-ish, we're going to pivot to the other leg and we're going to talk about what empowered people fishing looks like. And the great part is in August, we're going to have a church opportunity to go people fishing together. So this is critically important. I hope you won't miss a single Sunday. But what I want to do to wrap up here today, one of the things I know is that we all get our faith built up when we hear stories of what God has done. So I, I want to use the rest of our time today to just tell a couple of stories because I want you to know that this stuff isn't just theory. Jesus is really empowering people to do powerful ministry. So Juan Carlos, would you start? Would you come and share with us? Uh, Juan Carlos was one of our speakers at family camp and he did a fantastic job. Give him a big hand, please. Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful, powerful morning, right? I have an hour, right? I'm just, no. I just wanted to share this with you because it marked my entire life. After probably two weeks that I was rescued and saved from drugs and all that garbage, I started attending to this church, and I remember one this specific moment. I was having a um, Bible study with two other men and just with the pastor. And he was talking about believing how much we believe in Christ and, and the power is in Christ and all that stuff. But in the middle of this, this young boy, he probably, was, he was like eight, seven years old. He came to the church. So the pastor called him, interrupt our teaching, 
And of course, I didn't know the boy, but the other two guys knew because he was from the neighborhood. This was a small church and a really tiny uh, street. So anyhow, so he started uh, asking questions to the boy. He's like, what, do you will, what, what, is, what is one of the things that we would like to do the most? And he, say, he started saying, like, playing. Playing what? Soccer. And why you don't play soccer? And he was like, because I can. But why you can't? Because I get hurt. I didn't know this time that he had that disease that he can, if he runs, he can break bones or whatever. I don't know the name of it, but probably you know. Anyhow, so as he started getting more questions to him in front of us, my heart started breaking. I started feeling so much uh, compelling and, I don't know, hurt to see the young guy that he just want to play. So anyhow, so changing the subject right away, the pastor pointed out, says, who of you believe that Jesus can kill this boy right now? At that moment, I was in tears. I just raised my hand, and I started praying. And I got to tell you, I didn't know how to pray. It's not about fancy words or what we think. So I just remember that I just crying. I was bowling, and I wasn't even looking at the boy. I was just crying to God. Let him be a normal kid. Let him play. So the other guys were kind of like that. They kind of joined to the prayer. So after a while, so the boy left, everything done. That was it. About two or three weeks after that, I don't remember exactly, there was a Sunday morning. And after the worship, so when, before the start of the, 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 ser uh, the sermon, that church, the doors of the church, they were literally on the street. So if you will open, you, the door was, was always open. It was Hermosillo too hot. So the door was open and you were literally, the car was there, right? So the pastor, before they start the sermon, was like, somebody saw the beat? Where is the beat? So everybody started like, oh, I think it's outside. Somebody go and grab the beat. So they came and they went and grabbed the boy. So at that moment, I didn't realize anything. So the boy came with, he was sweating. He was sweating like a pig. <laughs> and he was there. And the pastor said, like, David, what are you doing? I was playing. How come you were playing in our church? <laughs> and, just, and then it's like, well, and tell us what you were playing. Soccer. Soccer? Come on. How many, how many times today you felt in the ground learning to play soccer? It was like, <laughs> a few, he had a few scratches around. So at that moment, to me, it didn't make sense yet. When I was just looking around, the whole church went on their knees, praising God. In that moment, I remember, this is the boy that you pray for. So I, start, I went on my knees as I started praising the Lord. You see, God broke my heart in the same way that his heart was broken for this boy. Yeah. That's, and now I understand that. That was a key point. God want you, God want us to break our heart so that we can feel how much he hurts how much he craves for save these people. In whatever shape or form, and he used miracles to just shake people, to convince people. But the important thing for me, and I want to be done with this, is what is the purpose? What is the main goal in your heart to reach out those miracles? You want, if you wish, and you want, and you crave, your heart breaks in the same way the God heart breaks, you will see an amazing miracles. Amen. Okay, this is... Thank you.
great story, and I feel like you are applauding for one, Carlos. <laughs> this is what Jesus did. Now, can we praise Jesus with a round of applause? Okay. <laughs> Kelly, you've got a story. I'm going to move this. I, I, you know, it's... Um it's kind of humbling because, you know, when literally your job is, is to minister to people, it's amazing to me how obtuse I can be about receiving God's miracles for me. I can believe for you more than I can believe for me. And so it's so amazing when God in his goodness shows up and surprises me. We were doing our Zillennials um, group, Go Team 4, um, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, we were, um, we were, we were doing one of our field trip nights. So we were at, uh, Jason and Naomi Birkin passes and we were having a fire and we were having a good time. And, um, and we were just at the point where we were just in prayer and, um, I mean, it's dark and not really, it's what? Yeah, it was. It was. That's right. It was real cold. We were just trying to survive, and <laughs> and um, you know, I was ready to move on because I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking uh, yeah, I, I just don't I don't have the ball. And, you know, I, I want I always think of Holy Spirit passing the ball amongst people, and I'm always looking for who's got it, you know, and making space for that, and also being humble enough to know when it's not me. And I knew I didn't have anything, and so I thought, well, maybe we're coming to a close. And then all of a sudden, like, we were starting to transition, and then my son-in-law, Connor, he says, Mama, I, I want to pray for you. And, uh, and he, it was not, like, complicated. It was very simple. And he just laid his hand on my shoulder. Um, if he could even reach me, I can't even honestly remember I remember my name today, and I feel that that's really progress. Um, <clears throat> and I remember Cam's name, too. Um, <laughs> um, these, these are all camp <laughs> jokes. It, it just yeah, sorry. FOMO. FOMO. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, and, and he prayed for me, and, and I had been really battling. I'd been battling for quite some time with reactive airways, which, uh, you know, is a problem that happens. You have this dry cough, and it happens. Usually, it's allergy induced, and so if you can get the allergies to go away, you can get the the cough to stop. And it just was really struggling. And um, I have been having this secret fear, and now the whole world will know. Um, I've been afraid that I was losing my voice and that I wouldn't be able to sing anymore. Um, whew, I didn't think that was going to get me. Mm -hmm. I love worship, mm -hmm. and um, when I said yes to shifting to um, teaching, it was so clear to me that there was a shift that needed to take place, and so I had taken a step back from worship, but uh, I just felt like I was going to lose my voice, and I wasn't going to be able to do it again, and so I thought, oh, I guess I'm just disqualified now, like um, maybe it's just not something I'm supposed to do anymore. And uh, and he prayed for me, and I didn't notice until I said, okay, God, in my heart, like, I'm not really sure this is going to happen or not, but I won't take my allergy pill because I want to give you the best shot. <laughs> Good. And so I didn't take my allergy. I've been on them every single day for a year, and I um, didn't take it, and uh, it was probably two or three days later when I recognized that I was no longer coughing and that my voice was restored. Yeah. You know, that's just a precious dad <laughs> who loves me. So. Okay, come on, clap for Jesus. This is what Jesus does. Musicians, would you come? Okay, here's where we're going to go. We're going to sing that song more than able again. This is a song for us. 
for now. He is more than able. And I don't know about you, but that line, who am I to deny what the Lord can do, that just, that just goes right here for me. And if, if you are doubting today, would you use this song as confession and let Jesus begin to strengthen and encourage your faith. And then I've asked Jason to come and lead us in some kind of um, activation when we're done singing this song. And I know what time it is. I don't care. If you need to go, would you just slip out quietly at any point? But we're going to stay here as long as Holy Spirit is at work. Okay? So stand to your feet. Let's worship.